As Peter said, this is a collaborative effort, and Peter would not be happy if I didn't start it with a photograph of a plant. It's the one thing I know about orchids. It has a wonderful name, Dracula. I want to, first of all, ask how many species there are, and I'm going to give you the answer is that we don't know. Um, but nonetheless, we can work out how many species are going extinct, at least the rate at which they're going extinct. Um, and we can use that information to, to come up with recommendations that are actionable. Professor Archer has asked us to be looking for actionable recommendations, and I'm going to provide some. So if we look at the number of, the number of described species, they total approximately 1.9 million species. Fungi clock in at a little bit less than 100,000. Vascular plants, about 340,000. Terrestrial animals, mostly arthropods, in excess of a million, and so on. The problem with this, of course, is that we know that these are only a tiny fraction of, of the number of species that are likely to be out there. There are guesses of fungi everywhere from 0.5 to 10 million. Uh, Peter and I have converged on a, an estimate of 460,000 species of plants, and since it's Peter's estimate, nobody is likely to dare challenge it. Um, terrestrial animals, anywhere from 3.5 to 12 million, of species, marine animals, um, uh, people who are not marine specialists think up to two million, marine people think substantially less. In other words, it's really anybody's guess how many species there are. There are lots of authoritative studies that come up with estimates with very confident confidence intervals, and those confidence intervals do not overlap. So if we're going to tackle the problem of how fast species are going extinct now, the one thing we cannot sensibly do is talk about how many species are going extinct per day. Um, prior to 20 years ago, people would talk about three or 30 or 300 species going extinct per day. It was really the same number, depending on whether you thought there were one, 10, or 100 million species. And it was politically dangerous because politicians in the United States would say, if species are going extinct at the rate of 30 per day, name them, um, and we couldn't. So um, the issue then is how can we come up with a more convincing estimate of how many species there are? Well, the simple-minded notion is that as you describe more species, that the rates of species description should drop uh, because you know, there are fewer to describe. It's like collecting anything. Of birds on my life list, baseball cards, stamps, all the rest of it. The more you have, the fewer new ones there are. But in fact, if we look at the rates of species descriptions, both on land and in the ocean, we see that the rates of species descriptions are at historical highs. We're describing more species now than we have ever done in the past which is a little bit worrying because it suggests some infinite number of species out there. Um, uh, but the one thing we also know is that taxonomists are breeding like rabbits, that there are more taxonomists now than in the past, uh, and before the taxonomic community rises up and kills me, uh, for, for, for the such intemperance. By taxonomist, I mean somebody who describes the species. More people are describing species now than, than ever in, in the past. 
And so if we look at the, the species described per taxonomist, for most groups, those rates are falling. And so we can begin to use these kinds of, of results. Species per taxonomist will eventually go to zero. Taxonomy will end. And at that period of time, we'll know many, how many species there are. The only problem with that, however, are insect taxonomists. Insect taxonomists, please note the logarithmic scale on the left, have been growing exponentially since uh, uh, Linnaeus. There are ever more insect taxonomists. And the rates of species description per taxonomist are not falling particularly dramatically, suggesting that there is no end in sight for insect taxonomy. I have a deep family concern about plant taxonomy. I want to know how long plant taxonomy will continue because my elder daughter is an orchid systematist. And so my first calculation was how long orchid system systematics will last. And the answer is it will last for her career and I am suitably relieved. <laughs> so how fast the species are going extinct. We know from Al Gore in An Inconvenient Truth um, that the extinction rate is now a thousand times higher than normal, the normal background rate. You might ask from whom Al Gore got it, and the answer is from me, although he didn't exactly say, my buddy Stuart Pym told me. It comes from this work, and what we wanted to do in this paper was to define a metric for extinctions that was defensible, that we could quantify it, and it was not going to be subject to these considerable uncertainties in terms of how many species there are. Extinction rates are death rates, pure and simply. And we express human death rates as numbers like, you know, 15 deaths per 1,000 people per year. Human mortality runs somewhere between 10 and 20 deaths per 1,000 people per year. If it's much higher than that, it's in the place where you don't want to be. So we measure species mortality in the same way as extinctions per million species per year. And we choose per million species as simply to make the numbers integers. This is just a scaling matter. It makes the numbers easy. If we look at what we know about species extinctions, you have to take species from when they are known. It's rather like following people. You start out with a cohort of people from when they were born, and you follow them individually until they die. Um, species are born in the sense of taxonomists describe them, and you can look for a cohort of, of species and follow them to the present and look at the fractions of species that had been killed off. And if we look at data for birds, mammals, and amphibians, which are the three taxa that we know best, those rates run from about 50 to 600 extinctions per million species per year. Um, the details show that species that are described more recently, since, say, 1900, have higher extinction rates, and that's because they're rare. We discovered the common ones early. Linnaeus knew about the common ones. We're now discovering species that are rare. And what this tells us, incidentally, is species that we have not yet discovered the perhaps 70,000 species of flowering plants not yet described by plant taxonomists. We know that species like that are likely to be uh, endangered, they're likely to be in this category of high extinction. So these extinction rates are underestimates given our considerable ignorance of the species that we have not yet described. A much more difficult question is how fast should species be going extinct? There are a variety of different approaches to this. 
and with colleagues I've looked at this, in, including Peter and I, I've looked at this in, the, in, in a, couple of, a couple of different ways. There are really three kinds of evidence. There's fossils, there's the diversification rates, and then there are the details of molecular phylogenies. While the fossil data are superficially the most direct and the most useful, as we've just heard, they're actually very, very difficult to interpret um, clearly. They are temporarily coarse, you know, five million years is merely a blink in the eye of a paleontologist. They are limited, mostly limited, to marine hard-bodied taxa. Um, and they generally involve genera and not species. In fact, paleontologists like to talk about families rather than genera, only occasionally genera, and very, very rarely species. So it's very hard to come up with, with data from the fossil record that give you a very good idea of what this background rate is. What you can deduce is that typical background loss rates are on the order of 0 0.01 genera per million genera per year, um, a fairly low number. Um, quite clearly, extinction rates of species are going to be higher than that. You have to bump off a lot of species to get rid of a genus. But they also suggest that there's no recent natural um, shrinkage in the number of species. Before human activities came along, um, there wasn't some you know, uh, you know, pre-modern extinction rate of species that was in any way useful. Uh, uh, anyway unusual. Um, I don't want to talk about the details of molecular phylogenies. You can extract both um, uh, speciation rates and extinction rates from them, but it is very difficult and very tedious. But what I do want to address is this simpler and I think entirely relevant statement about diversification rates. Given that we're wiping out species, how quickly can we recreate diversity? How, can recent, how quickly can we, can we bring back creation? And diversification rates are a birth rate. If we're talking about a human birth rate, we would probably say there are approximately 15 babies per 1,000 people per year. Diversification rates, similarly for species, we can measure as you know, new species per million species per year, a number that is entirely compatible with the, with the extinction rate. And so there are thousands of molecular phylogenies um, like this one. This happens to be a group of South African orchids. Um, it's particularly rich, and it's got lots of detail, and it's got lots of interesting ecological aspects to it, and it's a plant uh, because I have to keep Peter happy. If you look at the, the number of lineages, it's growing approximately exponentially. So you can build a model that says the expected number of species is E raised to the 1 minus mu uh, times T, where mu is the speciation rate and, uh, um, sorry, lambda is the speciation rate and mu is the extinction rate. It's a very, very simple kind of model. So what kind of rates do we deduce from, from the literature? And the answer is across a huge variety of different taxa, um, looking at plants, looking at arthropods, mollusks, chordates, birds, mammals, using a variety of different methods to, to correct the data, which don't actually make a great deal of difference. But the approximate rate of diversification is that species are born at the rate of about one per 10 million species per year. And I was interested to look at how long it takes species to come back after a, a, a cataclysm like the, the, uh, the Cretaceous. And this suggests that the number of species would double in about 10 years, uh, 10 million years. 
So in other words, if you have a catastrophe that wipes out 50% of your species, 10 million years, you'll get those species back. And that's a number that's broadly comparable with the data that we get from, from the fossil record. So we now have, if not exactly a death rate, at least a birth rate, a net birth rate. And it's this comparison of somewhere between 50 to 500 extinctions per million species per year compared to being born at one per 10 million species per year that leads to the conclusion that we're knocking off species at a thousand times the, the background rate. We are destroying biodiversity a thousand times faster than natural processes can recreate it. So, if we look at all these other sources of evidence, we find that they are broadly compatible with each other. I've used the molecular data because they are so broad taxonomically, uh, they, they cover well-defined periods of time, um, and, and they are extremely um, varied in terms of the ecosystems and the, and the species involved. So, what can we do with these data? What can we do about our knowledge of the current extinction crisis that leads to, to action? Geography matters. Now, I hope this is going to work. The number of species of birds and mammals and amphibians, we can now map out with some considerable detail. These are birds, and they show that the greatest numbers of species are in the tropical moist forests of the world, a pattern that covers all the continents. The interesting and unusual aspect, however, is when we begin to look at species in terms of their geographical range sizes, look at the species that have smaller than the median range. Those distributions are profoundly different. They are concentrated in special places, what my colleague Norma Myers calls hotspots. We can do mapping for other taxa that are not as spatially resolved as for birds and mammals, but begin to show broadly comparable patterns. For example, if we look at um, freshwater fish, um, highest concentrations of species are in, uh, in the Amazon, for example. But if we look at endemics, by which we mean small ranged species, there are river basins worldwide that don't necessarily have a lot of endemic, uh, don't necessarily have a lot of species, but nonetheless have a lot of species that are found nowhere else. Um, so we're beginning to expand our catalogue of, um, of, of, of maps of, of biodiversity. We can begin to do this for plants at Again, a rather coarser a level of analysis. But you can see fairly clearly that um, um, plant species are concentrated in, in a relatively small number of places. The Northern Andes, the Caribbean, um, Southeast Asia, particularly Southeast China, Southwest China, um, Madagascar. Um, I put this up in the context of the H targets, which uh, aspire to protect two-thirds of the world's plants in 17% of the land area. And in fact, you can do that if you, if you select your areas um, um, appropriately. So we can begin to, um, to expand the catalog of how to map where biodiversity is to, to other taxa, but plants in this case. And, and I do not want to steal uh, Professor Lubchenko's thunder, but we are beginning to be able to map out marine biodiversity in cons some considerable detail. These are snails of the genus Conus, work done by my friend and colleague, Callum Roberts, uh, that show you know, very high concentration 
concentrations of species in this case in what we call the coral triangle, the, the areas of ocean in, in, in Southeast Asia. I also want to make an obvious point that tropical forests which hold two-thirds of the world's plants, two-thirds of the world's animal species, also hold two-thirds of the world's cultures as measured by language. So when we talk about the Amazon, when we talk about the threats to the Amazon, particularly the Western Amazon, through exploration for natural gas and for oil, um, we should not forget that the Amazon is not vacant. It is not a open landscape where no people live. There are indigenous groups living there. These are friends of mine who are Warani um, from the Ecuadorian Amazon. Uh, these two gentlemen first met the outside world when they were children. There are other groups living nearby that are still uncontacted. When we talk about biological diversity, we ought to include our own biological diversity, at least as measured by our, uh, by our linguistic diversity. And we speak 6,500 languages. At the current rate, in a generation, we'll only speak 600. And when we talk about destroying tropical forests, we ought not to forget uh, the people living in those forests who we are also typically destroying. So, threatened species. There were broadly two kinds of threatened species. To the public, what comes to mind immediately um, is ca encapsulated by Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz when she said, lions and tigers and bears, oh my, will there be wild things out there? And the answer may all too soon be no. I don't want to talk about lions. These are species that have huge geographical ranges and any kind of solution to protect lions and other big predators has to address the fact that living next to big animals like that is profoundly dangerous. Having spent many nights in tents with lions sniffing around them, you have a different view of a lion than when you see it in the zoo. I don't have time to talk about the issues that we are dealing with, I think, very successfully at National Geographic's Big Cats Initiative that try to minimize human-wildlife conflict. Rather, I want to point out the fact that if you look at where most of the world's threatened species are, they match where most of the world's small range species are. As with the fossil record, small geographical range is the single best predictor of risk of extinction. Small range means a high risk of extinction. And I want to talk about one simple case history. If we map out where threatened bird species are in the Americas, or for that matter, threatened plant species, or threatened amphibian species, or threatened mammal species, we quickly find there are two areas of concentration. There's the coastal forests of Brazil, and there is the northern Andes. These are places where there are high concentrations of species with small geographical ranges and high levels of habitat destruction. The coastal forests of Brazil, the Mata Atlantica, have lost 95% of their forest cover, most of it in the last 100 years. It's not surprising that that just a position of habitat loss and endemism uh, means that that's where the greatest concentration of species are. What we can do, of course, um, is to go from these strategic maps of broadly where um, uh, concentrations of threatened species are, what my colleague Norma Myers called biodiversity hotspots, uh, and produce tactical maps like this. This is a map of uh, Rio de Janeiro State. That big bay there is Guanabara Bay. The city of Rio de Janeiro is off to the left. 
Everything that is color-coded is forest. If it's gray, the forest is gone. And we have color-coded it by the number of threatened species that occur there. In this case, birds. We know birds well, uh, but it's surely true of butterflies. It's probably even true of nematodes. It's certainly true of plants. And when we look at that landscape of where the greatest concentration of threatened species are, we notice that it's highly fragmented. What we're dealing with are lots of isolated forest fragments. What we know from work done by my colleague Tom Lovejoy in the Amazon and work we've done elsewhere, both with him and with others, is habitat fragments lose species very, very quickly indeed. And so the strategic insight, which is to work here, combines with a tactical insight that says, fragments are bad, let's get rid of the fragments, let's reconnect the landscapes. We have not just merely destroyed so much of the world's tropical forests. What we have left behind is in tatters, in fragments. And those fragments are often too small for species to maintain viable populations. There just aren't enough males to go around for the females and females to go around for the males. And of all the places, of all the fragments, one that I thought was particularly tragic was the one immediately behind me. This is the Union Biological Reserve in coastal Brazil, about 100 miles east of the city of Rio de Janeiro. Because in this isolated patch of forest are a whole load of species on the brink of extinction, the most charismatic of which is a beautiful little monkey called the golden lion tamarind. And the golden lion tamarinds in that fragment could not go forth and multiply into the forest over there because there was the cattle pasture behind me. And when I saw that cattle pasture for the first time about eight years ago, a cattle pasture just like the one I'm standing in, I thought, it has to go. And so, we have made it go away. This is a restored forest. I helped raise money for my friends at the Asociação Mico Leon Delado, the Golden Lion Tamarind Association. I've planted this forest and it now connects that once isolated fragment of forest in the Union Biological Reserve to a much larger area of forest over in this direction. It's what we call a biological corridor. And it means that the golden line tamarinds that were once imprisoned in this forest island, this forest fragment behind me, can now cross through these small but growing trees and go and find new habitats, new homes, new places for their, for their tamarind families. I want to show you a couple of before and after photographs. This is what that area looked like um, eight years ago uh, with the isolated um, uh, Hezeva Union, the Union Biological Reserve on the right, uh, and the patch of forest off to the left. Uh, that's what it looks like now. Um, it's sufficiently connected that the tamarinds are moving between. Uh, the, uh, the pumas and other predators are moving backwards and forwards. We have reconnected this landscape. How did we do it? We used children. There they are planting trees. Between them, they've planted an awful lot more trees than I ever have. I think this is significant because protecting biological diversity has to be something that matters locally. Protecting the Amazon is of ultimate concern to the peoples who live there. 
protecting the biodiversity hotspots, convincing the, the rancher who put cattle on this landscape, um, not very successfully, it's a terrible place to grow cattle, they tend to lose weight, convincing the local community that um, it would be better to reforest, to plant trees, to bring the tamarinds back, to bring the tourists to look at the tamarinds is a better idea, is, going to, is a central feature of all the things that we do. Now, in summary, we don't know how many species there are. Numbers vary from a few million to many, many millions. But we can, taxon by taxon, work how fast they're going extinct. And the answer is on the order of a few hundred extinctions per million species per year. And we know from a huge body of information derived from molecular phylogenies that that's a thousand times faster uh, than nature can recover, a number entirely compatible with the geological evidence after mass extinctions. Extinction, modern extinction, is geographically concentrated. About 10% of the species have big geographical ranges, um, and we, we tend to wipe them out because they are dangerous to us or their livestock. Much the same is true in the ocean. We've wiped out many of the top predators. But 90% of the species at risk of extinction are found in geographically concentrated places, places where large numbers of small range species collide with high levels of habitat destruction. It's not just that we've merely destroyed the habitats, we have fragmented the habitats that remain, and that's something that we can undo by working with local communities, by working with local conservation groups, we can begin to stitch nature back together again. We can work with local groups who restore the land, restore the forest connectivity. And that is a very practical way of affecting what we have learned in conservation science uh, to prevent the loss of species extinction. Thank you very much.